Gigi, thank you so much for joining me on the ODAT Chad podcast. I'm glad to be here. So glad to be here. Well, listen, um, thank you for your patience. We had some scheduling <laughs> issues on my part. Uh, one of these days, I will master the art of the schedule and um, a couple of technical things, but you were so patient and I'm so glad we had a chance to say a quick prayer before we jumped on. So wel welcome to the podcast. Me too. I'm so glad to be here. Feels good. <laughs> so uh, what I typically do is I'll give you a few minutes to sort of share your experience, strength and hope as we say in some places, wink, wink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, um, but really just, you know, tell, give us a, you know, give you a chance to tell your story and then we can talk about your book, which is so amazing. 50 ways to worry less. Now I can't think of a topic that is more timely than that. Thanks. So, yeah. All right. So I'll start with my story. I'll tell you, um, I was kind of a different case and uh, and yet when i've told my story a lot of women say you know that resonates with me and some men too in the sense that i didn't drink every single day and um i didn't always uh gross myself out and everybody else when i drank but the consequences were piling up because by the time i was 38 and i had been for about i don't know four I don't know, six years or so, um, maybe more, using marijuana and alcohol to deal with my stress and to make myself feel good and to fit in in a crowd and, you know, to fall in love and to stay in love. And well, the consequence was that after, by the time I was 38, I was looking at my third divorce. I was in my third marriage and I, um, I had moved from grad California where I'd finished grad school and came to Michigan and um, married a wonderful guy who thank God was working Al-Anon and it was my third marriage. And he, um, he watched me drink and he saw the personality change, but um, he stayed kind of quiet about it. But the problem was within nine months of marrying him, and he was traveling for work, I started going out to bars and picking up strangers. And, you know, the, there were reasons for the other divorces, of course, but I, one of the reasons was, you know, I was a romance addict, you know, just for the, made the man my higher power, fell in love really fast, crawled into their back pocket, uh, and made, you know, that's what I thought we were supposed to do, you know, and then get married and have the children in the picket fence. And boy, by the time I was 38, none of that was happening. And, um, and I felt like I just couldn't succeed in relationships. And when I watched myself doing that behavior of already being promiscuous, and I, I went to a psychologist and I said, you know, I have this brand new PhD from Stanford, and I'm doing this behavior on the sly. Now, what the hell is wrong with the picture, you know? And, and he was, uh, you know, the right person because uh, he knew about alcoholism by the grace of God. And this was like in 84 when I first went, you know? Um, and he said, well, you know, getting your family history, you're in the early stages of alcohol. And I thought, oh, well, that's not so bad. The early stages of alcoholism, that's not, you know. And um, he said, but it will um, progress. And, uh, and he said, you know, if, you, if you're not convinced that you have a problem, do this experiment. And it's exactly what they say in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, try controlled drinking. So what he told me, he was more specific. He said to have two drinks, no more, no less, every day, and see what happens. So some days I could have the two drinks and stop. Other days I'd have the two drinks and the third and the fourth and go out to the bar and pick up the stranger. And I did that experiment and I watched for about six months and I realized, thank God I lived through it, uh, that I could not predict 
what I would do if I put even one drink in my body because there were too many times when I put the third and the fourth and the fifth and found the man and the drugs and endangered myself and others. Um, so I, that got my attention. Um, my husband knew about alcoholism and he was being very a good, uh, healthy Al-Anon. He was a former counselor. And so I was, you know, in denial and I was saying to him, I don't have a problem. And, and he was supposed to come to a therapy with me to talk about this, but he was on the road a lot and didn't come to the meetings uh, with the therapist. But anyway, I was still, you know, I don't have a problem somewhere in this six month period uh, during the experimentation. And, um, and I'll go get an evaluation from a professional, you know, because, uh, you know, I thought then I could prove that I wasn't. So we both went to the Brighton Hospital here in Michigan, outside of Detroit, which is a very good place. And um, I loved it because the therapist turned to me and he said, well, the counselor, he said, um, he didn't turn to me first. He turned to my husband first. And he said, you have a major problem with control. And I was like, yes. You know? <laughs> and he talked to my husband a little bit. And then he turned to me and he said, you have a fatal disease. It will only get worse. You uh, have a choice. You can you know, stop the behavior and get healthy, or you can keep going in the direction you are, and you're going to still get the same results you've had. And having an expert tell me that, you know, I'm, uh, I listened. And so not too long after that, um, I was sitting having dinner with this, my wonderful third husband. And he said, what would happen if this was your last drink? We were out to dinner and I was having a beer. And I thought, you know, that moment that little moment. Well, yeah, what if, what if this were my last beer? And I didn't order another one. And then the next night, they had one of those meetings where there was an Al-Anon meeting in one room and an AA meeting in another. And he went to the Al-Anon. Then he told me he'd been going to Al-Anon. <laughs> then he went to the Al-Anon meeting and I went to the AA meeting. And that was um, January 11th, 1986. And that was my last drink or drug ever, which I'm so grateful for. So I walk into this meeting. Well, you know, in those days, it was all smoky rooms and older men and, you know, and still when they talked about their disease and what, what their lives were like, I could totally relate. That was the gift. I did not go in and start comparing. And I could have compared a lot of things. But what I heard was, we're the same. If we have one drink, we can't control what kind of damage we're going to do to ourselves or others. And life just doesn't work if we keep on drinking, knowing that about ourselves. So I started going to maybe two to three meetings a week. I kind of had one foot in, one foot out. Didn't talk to people before or after, but you know, I was willing to, to go. And after about six months, I started feeling very um, envious of the women, especially the women, and I found a really good women's meeting. Um, the women who were saying, well, I talked to my sponsor about this, or I called my sponsor. I was like, oh, I wanna have a sponsor. But I was terrified to ask anyone to be my sponsor. My, um, you know, growing up in a dysfunctional alcohol ridden family, being the youngest of four, a highly sensitive child anyway, very prone to you know addictive behaviors and dysfunctional relationships. So of course, it took me a long time to ask someone to be my sponsor because I didn't trust that anyone would ever really be there for me. And I have to say that, you know, if you're on the edges of the program or any program, uh, that it's really worth joining with other people, especially women, if you're a woman, and men, if you're men, or someone with no, you know, people where there's no romantic triggers going on. And joining with those people 
who have found a way not to drink and to find happiness in their lives. I don't, we just can't crawl up to the top of the mountaintop and have a spiritual experience and, and get sober that way. Some people have, um, and I'm not saying there's only one way, but for me, I needed so desperately healthy relationships with other women because I always hung out with the men. I had, you know, a little bit of a good figure and I could, you know, uh, play those cards very artfully to get the attention. And so I didn't, I didn't know how to interact other than from that position of, I'm going to manipulate my behavior so that you like me, you know, and I did it, you know, with, with men, of course. Um, I did it, you know, in school, the little Miss Perfect, you know, get all the good grades and the degrees and, and that, be, you know, became who I was. And, um, but I, I always only had one main guy who was like my higher power. And then I had a using female friend, you know, and we'd get high together and go drinking together and so on. And that was the extent of my relationships, really. And I was pretending in both of those either, you know, also, but I didn't realize it. So to sit, I was talking about this with some recovering women on Zoom today. We were having a meeting and to sit with a group of people and sit there long enough and listen to them and everything they've done and all the honesty and vulnerability and to realize that this can be a safe place for me to be who, whatever the hell I really am. And when we start being that honest and then to find out that they just love who we are, <laughs> it's like a gift that when we walk into a room in my experience, it's been the 12-step programs just because that's what was really available in the 80s. And I'm not saying that that's the only one, but the strength of it is the infrastructure is already there. You've got tons of meetings everywhere. It's a systematic program, and uh, there's a lot of pluses to it. But they seem to see the light and the goodness in me when I couldn't see it. And I could feel that in them. They didn't care how many degrees I had or what, you know, None of those external things seem to be the important thing. The important thing was we all had this disease. Some were farther along in working against it and others were still struggling, but we all were sharing and supporting one another. That took me a long time to trust, you know, but after six months, I did get a sponsor. I had, I just wanted to have a sponsor because the people who were staying sober were working the steps and they said, don't work the steps without a sponsor. So I started with the sponsor and, um, oh, it was just so great. You know, this person made time for me and listened to me and affirmed my experiences and cared about me. And, you know, I, I never called her as much as I could have because I didn't want to bother her, but I did you know, meet with her um, every week or two, and we worked the steps together slowly and gradually. And, um, and I remember getting to the inventory step and uh, where you take a personal moral inventory. And that a lot of people are very afraid of. Um, it's preceded by the steps that ask you to kind of believe in something bigger than your fear which many people call a higher power, but you can define it any way you want, as long as it, as it isn't your own self-will where nobody can help me, you know? <laughs> um, so with the basis of some kind of a sense that there is something bigger than me going on here that's keeping me sober so far and bringing me these wonderful women, um, I was able to take the plunge for the fourth step. And that was where... Um, you know, I counted up every man I had slept with and I told my sponsor how many of the people I'd slept with and I'd felt so much shame about that. And she, that's what everybody says about when you share your inventory that your sponsor's never shocked. And you know, oh, I did something like that. It, it just completely dissolves the guilt. Well, a lot of it. And the rest of the steps are then getting rid of those negative patterns. And that's really how I began. I mean, the first layer, and we'll talk about layers of healing, 
in afterwards, uh, after I finish my little story here. But, um, you know, the first thing was just to address the alcoholism itself and the drug abuse itself and the sexual promiscuity itself. That's what I needed to work the steps on. And um, when I realized, you know, in my sixth step that I had all this low self-esteem that I had been using men and grades and everything just to feel good about myself, that, that was the, the beginning of the inkling that I had stinking thinking that, you know, a big part of what was wrong with my life was the way I thought so negatively about myself. And it turned out about a lot of other things, which eventually 30 years later led to, led to writing the book on overcoming worry. Um, but I remember the, I, I was so shocked that I had such negative self-talk that I, I uh, ordered an audio tape, you know, in those days they were cassettes on self-esteem and I plugged it in at night and I listened to it and it was just like that movie. They make fun of affirmations, you know, I'm loved, I'm happy, you know? Well, I was listening to those things as I was going to sleep. I'm lovable. People like me. And I, I guess, uh, cause I was still in therapy. I, I must've, and I understood by that time with therapy, some of that cognitive restructuring or changing our thinking and that you can reprogram your thinking. So I knew that my thinking really needed reprogramming <laughs> in terms of how I talk, talk to myself. So that was uh, the beginning of a long journey of growing into being able to um, give and receive love fully and openly and it's a gradual process, but I do want to finish the story about the marriages because <laughs> people are wanting, she was divorced three times, what happened? Um, so I did um, separate and divorce my third husband after a year of sobriety. And after counseling and after, uh, you know, I didn't just grab my my saddle and my skis and run like I had every other relationship. I actually, we went through therapy and all that. But anyway, so I was going to a meeting, um, you know, a couple of months after that. And I ran into this really nice guy and a bunch of people, well, he was in a group and the whole group of us went out afterwards. And I thought that is a really nice man, you know? And so I started getting to know him well after three divorces and I had two other crash and burn relationships that were at least, you know, living with and at, at least two years long. So really I had this long track record of awful relationships endings. So I was terrified when I met him and felt that I was attracted to him. And, you know, with the therapy and the program and my sponsor, I did everything differently. I only allowed myself to see him twice a week. I, did, I put a governor on myself. I did not allow myself to jump into his back pocket and live from there, move into him, you know, in with him, you know, immediately. Um, I kept up my female friends. I did not throw over my female friends so I could have more time with the guy. Uh, and this, I was in a program called, it was called Women Who Love Too Much. Um, but now there's a book, uh, because so many of us women have this problem, especially early in sobriety. Um, it's called, called is, it, is It Love or Is It Addiction, I think is the name. And the, the author's name is Brenda, and I just found it on Amazon, so I know it's there. Brenda, and her last name is Schaefer, which is S-C-H-A-E-F-F-E-R. Brenda Schaefer. She didn't have this book out then, but she had two little pamphlets and, and they really clarified the power plays that men can use to keep women kind of uh, under their thumb, so to speak. And especially if a woman has low self-esteem, it's really easy to buy into that. She just puts in black and white a lot of the uh, dysfunction and, and what I ultimately came to call whispered lies the lies I tell myself uh, that, you know, I must act this way for him to love me. 
I cannot have any conflict or he will leave me. I cannot risk being who I really am or saying what I really think or I'll lose this man. So that kind of thing. But anyway, um, so I had been working a lot on my dysfunctional patterns in relationships, but I continued and I took two and a half years getting to know Peter, my current husband. Uh, and we got married in, um, well, we just had our 31st wedding anniversary. So he, and it's like God was looking down or my higher power, however you think about that, and saying, you know, this woman really needs a man in her life. I'm going to send her a really good one because I'd like her to do a lot of other stuff besides just worry about relationships. <laughs> and uh, Peter, you know, is a very healthy guy and he'd been in therapy and uh, can stand on his own two feet and let me stand on my own two feet. And we, we both are kind of people pleasers, so we don't have a lot of conflict because we I guess we already had learned how to be pretty caring without um, giving up our power or our own self self sufficiency, you know. So it's a very wonderful gift for me to have that relationship, and uh, uh, and I'm happy now. I really, it's not because of the relationship; it's because of all the people that God has sent me. Like when you and I talked on the phone the other day, it was like, oh, we got to stay in touch. We're going to be buddies, you know. You can just uh, tell when people are on the same wavelength, you know. So, yeah, I'm very grateful. I sponsor people and, you know, do a lot. I'm, I still go to, I'd say, about three meetings a week. And then I'm a member of two other spiritual study groups because, you know, in step 11, continuing to have conscious contact and grow in our conscious contact with that higher power, um, it, it encourages us to branch out to other, besides just AA literature, to other uh, literature teachings, you know, could be Buddhism or whatever a person wants, you know, that appeals to us to lower the self-centered fear and increase our desire to be a good human being and be loving to others. So I, I have a couple of spiritual programs I'm involved with and, and that's been a real help too. So I think that's about all I have to say for my story. <laughs> Yay. Oh my gosh. I was like nodding the whole time um, and taking notes. I mean, uh -huh. I was dying to jump in, but um, I wanted you to be able to have, a, you know, a space to tell the okay. whole story. But, um, and you know, I've been sober a long time too, but I have never really heard anybody tell my story the way that you told my story, I was like, oh my gosh. It's so funny because I have summarized my entire drinking in um, a funny little tagline that I, I typically say that if it was in a bottle, a bag, or blue jeans, I was doing it. <laughs> I'm going to write that one down. Oh my gosh. And it's so funny. Um, I met a lady one time. She pulled me aside. She's like, oh my God, I was so embarrassed for you the first time I heard you say that. And I was like, bitch, please. You were not the, oh, the first version to show up to Alcoholics Anonymous. Let's be real. Um, <laughs> but it's so, okay. So there were so many things that, that I want to, um, everything, everything that you said. So everything from like the marijuana that was, I started with alcohol, but there was a whole lot of weed in between. And actually, like I had my last drink on my 25th birthday, but I smoked weed for another five months. That was harder for me to quit than the alcohol, to be perfectly honest. I didn't get the connection between the unmanageability and the, oh, yeah. and smoking weed. So, um, yeah, yeah, that was, that was eye opening. Mm -hmm. but the whole, um, yeah, those three things like performance, you were performance based, external validation type yeah. of stuff. I totally relate yeah. all that. Um, you did, I, and I don't, I don't want to, I don't want you to share anything you don't want to share, but you sort of touched on family dynamics that you, mm. you alluded that you had family members that yeah. had struggled with addiction. Do you want to share sure. like, a little bit about yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. That, um, you know, I mentioned, well, 
one of the points I wanted to make, and it fits with the answer to your question, uh -huh. is that um, one of the things that kept me away from therapy, even you know, taking the first step toward honesty, uh, and then getting as honest as you hear people get in the program or in recovery programs, was I was afraid, I knew I had all this um, fear, discomfort, self-loathing, shame, all these yucky feelings down inside. And I had been, I, I didn't know that I was actively suppressing them with the drugs and alcohol and sex and achievement, but I did, it was kind of working. You know, I could feel good when I got good grades, I could feel good. So my fear was, if I get into some place where I have to go into all that pain, it's going to be like ripping the Band-Aid off and all the pain's going to come out at once and overwhelm me and I won't be able to handle it. And if anybody has had that fear or still having that fear, I'm here to tell you it is not true. Right. It because with, if you're, well, I can only talk from my own experience, which did have a, a, a spiritual component of a higher power. Um, and when I did that third step where I said, I turned my will and my life over to the care of my higher power to heal me, that care manifested in this way. The Band-Aid came off just a little. Mm -hmm. And then I dealt with my alcoholism. Yeah. And I got that steady and my low self-esteem. That was the mm -hmm. first layer. Then, you know, they, they suggest that you keep going through the steps again and again as you hit things that are messing you up. So initially the alcohol messes us up. Then, mm -hmm. you know, then the overachieving. I was the perfectionist. That Jeez. was, you know. So I went to adult children of alcoholics. Okay. And that kicked off the second layer of healing because I sat there and I listened to all those people, you know, they, they have that list of characteristics like overachiever, um, not ever happy with what they achieve, uh, unsuccessful in relationships, gives the power to the man, you know, all these characteristics that are typical of people who grow up in alcohol homes, mm -hmm. alcohol driven homes. Yeah. When I saw that list, I just thought, there's no way I can heal from this. But mm -hmm. uh, again, the people around the table were farther down the line than I was. Right. And they could say, yeah, I had that too. And over time, working these steps and coming to these meetings, you know. So the alcoholic, I mean, the alcoholic family, I think the first thing, obviously, the dysfunctional relationships. <laughs> a big oh, my thing. goodness. Yeah. And that you know, I just kept working with my therapist and so on and went very slowly with Peter. But the um, overachieving and the perfectionism, I was in a, you know, I had a job by then um, teaching in a um, regional university and I was the star, right? <laughs> no you know, doubt. <laughs> and, and I worked my ass off and, you know, and I was a ball of stress. No wonder I was drinking every night and going out and picking up strangers because right. I was, you know, that was just, and it continued after I quit drinking. I still used, you know, still had that same need. So dealing with that layer of the adult child of an alcoholic and all those characteristics, the people pleasing, sure, you know, all of those, that was another layer. And I can't say that, you know, I did the first, well, the first layer of getting rid of the alcohol and drugs, that has to be done 100%. Right. But the second layer is a gradual growing out of those old habits and patterns through therapy and working the steps and meetings and so on. Um, now, the third layer was the one that came up after about five years of sobriety. And I was, I had seen well, it, it had to do with sexual abuse. So no oh. wonder I was terrified too. And uh, I was, I saw a show on rape, date rape and I was out with my sponsor 
and we were doing something fun, sailing or something on a lake. And I said, oh, I saw this thing on date rape last night. It was really so good. And is, I'm so glad that nothing like that happened to me. And then I felt this huge elevator drop in my stomach. And I thought, oh my God. Because we lived in a very um, adventurous, adventure-filled home with lots of colorful characters coming through and lots of alcohol and partying and you know, and I, so I don't know, I, I had a couple of memories. I started with a new therapist who specialized in sexual healing and uh, she was fabulous and she had a sexual healing group. The best thing I learned from that was that um, even though, you know, everybody says, well, you know, find the memory, find out exactly what happened. That was not the healing in the book that she suggested I read. It was about delving into the feelings that resulted from whatever happened. Okay. Not having to, you know, the feelings were, I'm not safe, right? Oh, I yeah. carried that in my whole life. So I kept trying to create my safety through grades, create my safety for the boyfriends. And boy, did it ever explain a lot when I realized that I'd been, you know, there was some inappropriate touching that mm -hmm. was, I do remember glimpses of it and it, mm -hmm. it, it took that safety away, you know. I'm not so, safe, yeah. Yeah, so my therapist walked me through, and my whole chapter five in my book, which was the hardest one to write, yeah. is about that, that healing um, and, and how my therapist led me through it. And, you know, the good news is I was able to uh, forgive both my parents and while mm -hmm. they were still on this earth, Mm -hmm. And I, know, I didn't ever have to have big talks with them about any of it because it was my work to do. Um, and a phrase I learned that I love is, um, you don't, you're not to blame for what happened to you, but you're responsible for healing it. Yeah, amen. And I love that. Yeah, so those are the layers, you, yeah. Can I ask you a quick question about the sure. forgiving the parents part? Because... Mm -hmm. um, I, I get the sense, and I've experienced this myself, is wanting the acknowledgement and validation that they um, made, uh, made a mistake. And, and making a mistake is a very uh, generic way of, you know, understating mm -hmm. some, some issues. Mm -hmm. um, but it sounds like you did not need to have them validate your feelings or apologize to you for what happened to you. How did you let no, that no. go? No. How did you forgive that? It is a spiritual practice. And if okay. anyone wants to learn more, and I go into forgiveness a lot in the book too, okay. in part of it. Um, there's a book called The Shack. Yes. And it, I, I, it's it. where I learned about forgiveness. But mm. I, you know, my therapist had me vent my negative feelings in a letter that I never say, sent, okay. you know, role playing, yelling yeah. and screaming, writing, you know, a lot of um, ways of releasing the feelings without having to confront them directly. There was one thing my dad was still doing into my adulthood, the way he would hug me, all my sisters, and put his thumb on the side of our breast when he was hugging us. Oh, gross. Isn't that awful? And I, my sisters and I thought it was cute until I was sitting in that therapy group and I told them and their jaws just fell on the floor. Yeah. That was the one thing where I did talk to my father and say, and I didn't say, you made me into a, you know, all these divorces, you're your fault. No, yeah. yeah, right. I didn't do any of that. I just said, when you hug me like that, it makes me very uncomfortable and I want you to stop. And he said, oh, okay, no problem. It was one of the scariest things I'd ever done. Oh my God. Because it was claiming my power to be safe, right? Yeah. So setting the limits, doing the forgiveness work, venting the feelings, working with a therapist. Yeah. Um, this new therapy, the eye movement, rapid oh, EMDR. Uh, EMDR. I've done that. It's amazing. This is what the people I know whom I really respect are saying is the best tool for those kinds of trauma from mm -hmm. the back. 
that from the past and so you've done it so you can tell people about it at some other time sure. it wasn't in existence when i did it you know was doing this healing but yeah um but it's amazing that you've yeah. been able to process that like you i love and I, thank you for saying I, i've heard that um it's not your fault but it's your responsibility sort of a mm -hmm. idea and um and I do feel like it's important to like acknowledge it, feel it, process it, but move the fuck on. Excuse me for swearing. Yeah, you haven't, you haven't exactly. dropped a single swear word, but, um, yeah. but it's like, we have right. to move on at some point, mm -hmm. not because the feelings aren't valid, but if you want to attract or develop something better, we have to start focusing on what we do want, not on what we don't want. Well, that's true. Yeah. There, there is another resource and I can give, send you the links and stuff. Sure. Yeah. I'll add, I'll add everything that you've, that you've mentioned in the show notes. Um, anyway, it's called radical forgiveness and the guy <laughs> it's radical forgiveness.com. I'm pretty sure if it's not, I'll put it in, I'll send it to you. Okay. Yes, it might be not. .org, but it's radical forgiveness.org. But, um, Chapter six brings that in because it, um, and my husband started drinking again. I met him in AA and oh, he, he started drinking again after 30 oh, years sober shoot. and I went nuts. So I worked Al-Anon also. <laughs> uh, and Peter, Peter started drinking again? Yeah. Yeah. Is he still drinking? No. Well, socially, he has two drinks, no more, no less. Whoa. Yeah, that's how God worked it out. But I didn't know how it was going to work out. I was terrified. Yeah. Um, but this radical forgiveness, I used it to help with that. Um, first, it, it, the gist of it is, and this may be a bit far-fetched, but not, none of us knows how this all works anyway, in terms sure. of why things happen to us, you know. Yeah. But the theory is that he... Whenever we have trouble with somebody or something, it's designed for our best growth. Mm -hmm. It's like the sand in the oyster. Mm -hmm. And if we rise to the occasion and access uh, support from other people, and in my case, spiritual tools, we can heal. But it takes us being driven crazy first <laughs> Like with our alcoholism, yeah, just yeah. the same with any character flaw or sure. negative pattern, mm -hmm. it's going to kick our butt until we decide, you know, or the universe will fashion it or create it like happened with Peter. I mean, I, don't, I was not yeah. being punished, but it was an opportunity. An opportunity. And so I use this radical forgiveness process to acknowledge that I had made him into my father, mm. who was the, the functioning alcoholic. Mm -hmm. And I had pasted my father's face on his. I also needed to set boundaries, and that's how we agreed on the two drinks, no more, no less. Or no, you know, he, a lot of times he never has a drink. Right, but right, I mean, no more, yeah. Um, two drink maximum. Yeah. <laughs> Instead so of a we, two drink you minimum. Know, yeah, yeah. Um, and that's how it worked out for me. So that's why wow. I kind of had to write the book because I wanted to, well, I've, I wanted to write kind of like a memoir at first because I'd had a lot of adventures in my life. And I thought, well, who's that going to help? So I'll use the stories around things I've experienced that yes. helped me discover tools that would heal the thing yes. that was bugging me. Yes. Um, so in, you know, the that radical forgiveness was one of the many tools that I use to help forgive this, but there's 50 of them. Yeah, there are 50 tools in the book because I had a lot of healing to do. <laughs> I'm still discovering new ones. I'm sure. <laughs> I know there's so many tools, yeah. so many resources. Yeah. Um, so the name of your book is 50 oh, ways. Here, I'll hold it up. There it is. 50 Ways to Worry 50 Less Now. 50 Ways to Worry Less Now. By Gigi Langer, yeah. PhD. You went to Stanford. That is so amazing. Oh, the, the achiever in me. You know, if I just get this degree, I'll be happy, right? So was there, <laughs> were there a lot of women? There couldn't have been a lot of women in that program when you were going through yeah, it. Yeah, because it was, um, 
Psychological Studies in Education. Oh, oh okay. Education, and education already has a lot of women in it. A lot of yeah. women. Okay. Because yeah. I was thinking there's a lot of boys at Stanford. <laughs> I bet you had fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. And it's so funny because, well, it's not funny. I, I mean, my mind is racing. I was like, because I've been to... I used to, I used to live within driving distance of Stanford university. Oh, Yeah. So like in high, yeah. So like in high school, early college age days, Mm -hmm. you know, the girls and I were like, Oh, let's go to Stanford and go to some of those uh, frat parties. Let's, let's hook up with some, (laughs) you know, smart, rich boys, (laughs) you know, because there's a a lot of us think that, you know, it's either money or men that are going to save us. Right. It's either love or money. Sure. And sometimes both. And um, as it turns out, we're not that far off. It is love that saves us, but it shows up in an entirely different way than what we're looking for. So sometimes we don't recognize it when it shows up. Yeah. Beautifully said. Yeah. Um, Let's see, but what else was I going to ask you? You know, it's it's tempting to want to tell all the stories. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But as you were talking, it reminded me, and I was going to ask you, so I'm so glad you brought it up about the, the third layer about the sexual abuse and, mm. and things like that. Um, I don't know if you, you didn't say abuse, but um, you know. Well, it, yeah, it was an appropriate touching and it, okay. it took away my sense of safety. So I classify it as abuse, but. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. But you know, it wasn't until I got into recovery that I learned that women who tend to be promiscuous are often, not always, but the majority of the time they've been sexually abused. And it's a way to sort of try to reclaim your power in a way is how, I, how it was explained to me. But it's so interesting how our society responds to women who, are, who own their sexuality or act out or are promiscuous. Like now that I know what I know, I hear, you know, I have two boys that went through high school. One of them is still in high school. And um, the first time it came up that, um, they're, you know, the slut shaming, I go, hey, just so you know there is a very high likelihood that she was sexually abused as a child. And Mm. that is one of the signs is um, promiscuity. And so let's not, let's not um, re-traumatize her some more, you know, let's uh, understand what this is really about. This is a woman who deserves compassion and understanding so she can stop acting out is kind of how I Mm -hmm. felt about it. It led to some very interesting discussions in our house, but um, yeah. And that's such a, um, it's really the essence of living out of a um, spiritual, even, I guess you could say Buddhist or any healthy Mm -hmm. point of view, because we can't be happy when we're condemning others. Exactly. Or judging others. Right. We cannot be happy. I mean, because what brings us happiness? You know, it's, it's a, giving and receiving love with no strings. Yeah. And so it, it's, it's really a beautiful thing you're teaching your son. Yeah. And it was also the, along the lines of that idea that you can't escape the same measuring stick that you judge others by, <laughs> you know, it's like, if you hold other people to such an impossible high standards, then, mm-hmm. you know, then we all, we often fall short ourselves and where's the empathy and compassion you know, for ourselves. I love how you, your natural instincts, Gigi, to gravitate towards, uh, like there was something inside you that knew that self-esteem was something that was going to help you. The the whole self-love thing. I teach a, Mm -hmm. I teach a class on rebuilding self-esteem after addiction. Oh, fabulous. Yeah. It's so good. It's so good. Yeah. yeah. That's, and that's going to be your book too. It is. Which which we're going to I know. I need uh, (laughs) you. Okay. So just a little God story. So um, I was having one of those moments. Mm -hmm. So you and I had already connected. We had it on the calendar that we were going to talk and a few days go by and I sort of had this overwhelming, I had an experience where I reached out to somebody for help and, and this person and I had been friendly and, um, and she's in the business and deserves to get paid and deserves all the blah, blah, blah. But she wanted $500 just to talk to me. And I was so sad. And um, 
I was like, you know, having a moment of self-pity, like, oh God, who's going to help me? And then the next day you and I talked and it was like, oh my gosh, I just asked God for help. And he sent me a woman who has a PhD from Stanford. (laughs) And I just was like, oh my God, God really loves me. (laughs) He sent me Gigi. That's so amazing. Oh yeah. Oh, that'll be fun to work on together. I mean, I'm, I'll stay No, no, no. Yes, yes, yes. For support. Thank you. Yes. No, I appreciate your humility. I don't charge, you know, that's (laughs) Yeah. About 12 step programs, we give it away, you know. Oh, and right. by the way, speaking of giving away, yes, I made my book into an audio book. Oh, <gasps> a really good workbook with it. Okay, PDF. And I have some free tokens left oh my for goodness. the audio book. Thank you. So okay. I will put, or you can put my website in the show notes. Because, I will, absolutely. Um, and, and my email because you can either go to the website gglanger.com and click on contact and contact me that way. Okay. And say, please send me the token, you know, the code number so I can get my free audio book. Yes. Or they can email me and I can get, give you that email to put in the show notes also. You have my email. But that is, that is very generous. I will include yeah. that. And yeah. and I don't mean to say that I don't, didn't, didn't support that woman who was, you know, trying to make a living. I do believe that people should be supported and I do want to support you as well. And, um, um, yeah, I I don't want you to give the whole thing away for free, but we'll, we'll do it for the first five, maybe. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. I I don't know. Yeah. I don't have that many left. So until. Oh, okay. (laughs) But listen, should we talk a little bit? Um, you you have discover 50 techniques to, to overcome, Uh, you know, you're talking about chronic worry and stress, perfectionism, dysfunctional relationships. Jeez. Mm -hmm. I don't know who doesn't. So I don't know. We've been talking a lot about relationships and I know a lot of women struggle with toxic relationships. Do you want to maybe just talk about a couple of things? Mm -hmm. Um, and then we can, we can wrap up with, um, sort of how you maintain your recovery, but I would, I would love to know maybe some of your ideas about how women can deal with toxic relationships. Sure. So we're going to be in toxic relationships until we get healthy ourselves. Right, right. And the first step in getting healthy is to stop using things to numb our feelings so that when we're doing toxic things, when we're doing dysfunctional things, and we get the consequences, if we just numb the consequences, we'll continue doing the same thing over and over again. So um, we really need to have the guts to wake up, to go to a therapy or someplace where uh, and, and to get totally honest with ourselves about uh, the fact that there is a problem and nothing will change if nothing changes. Mm-hmm. And it's okay when, if you don't know what the change is, when you just say to the universe, this is not okay, something needs to change, yeah. and you go for help, things start shifting. Um, so, you know, not using substances, coming to terms with, I think Al-Anon is a perfect place for people mm. to go. If you grew up in an alcoholic home, they now have adult children of alcoholics meetings with big books and meetings all over. Um, they have um, Al-Anon, if you're struggling with someone in your life that you're wanting to control and fix because they're so dysfunctional, or if you're in a relationship that feels like they're the one that's mostly dysfunctional, um, that whenever anyone, there's, there's never a one-sided dysfunction because right. this, pers- this person catches it. You know, if you weren't dysfunctional before, you're going to catch it if you're with a toxic person and it's going to mess you up. I always say that water seeks its own level. <laughs> yes, right. That's right. So that means that Al-Anon is a great place to go if you don't, you know, you don't know where to start. Okay. And if you don't have a substance abuse problem, I mean, obviously, you, if you have a substance abuse problem, you're going to address that first. But Al-Anon teaches you how to set boundaries, Okay. how to learn what's appropriate in terms to what to accept from people. And you're mm. sitting there with a bunch of mostly women who have learned how to negotiate. Many, I know women who I know in Al-Anon are in relationships with alcoholic husbands and 
still able to have a healthy, happy life in spite of the fact that the husband is still being alcoholic. Uh, and that's, you know, so not everybody leaves the relationship, mm -hmm. but you get healthy enough yourself to uh, know what the best way to proceed is. Okay. And any decision made out of fear, anger, resentment is not going to be a good decision. It has to be come from a centered, healthy place in yourself. So if you're having relationship issues, get yourself healthy first. Get yourself the place healthy to start first. Is a therapist if you can afford it or a counselor. Okay. Yeah. And boundaries. That's really good. Yeah. Um, what about chronic worry and stress? Do you, what, do you have some ideas that you can throw yeah, out? Yeah. Some quick wins. <laughs> so, um, well, there's a technique that a lot of us learn in, in the, in the 12 step rooms called, um, well, it sounds like all the techniques I'm suggesting are spiritual. And if you're listening, that's not true. Many of them are energy techniques, mm -hmm. like the, the tapping. Oh, and, yeah, EFT tapping. Yeah, and, uh, and I had a lot of good help with that. And other ones are mind reprogramming with the cognitive science now that you re reprogram the, the patterns in your brain. And so it's not all spiritual. So this technique is one that's a little of both, spiritual and reprogramming. And uh, right. you know it. It's called the golden key. But oh, this, yeah. Yeah. But it, it, the original form of it was you notice yourself having a worry thought. And we all have worry thoughts and we'll never stop having them because right. we're okay. humans and we have this primitive part of our brain that's always looking for danger. Got it. So never beat ourselves up for having a fear thought or a worry. Uh, it's just what we do with it next. Does it sit in our heads and take up free rent and completely control our reality? Or are we able to use techniques like this one to calm it down. So um, it's when we catch ourselves worrying, the golden key, we turn the golden key and we think about something that's more positive. Okay. Now, the original one was more spiritual where you think about different ways of thinking about a higher power or God. But uh, a lot of us use it this way. I've noticed that I'm worrying and oh, there I am worrying it. Okay, I'm not going to beat myself up. What can I think about instead? And I think, okay, I just start telling myself encouraging things, you know, all is well, mm -hmm. um, life is good, or I use a mantra, you know, uh, or a little repetitive statement. I mean, one I like is, um, I turn this over to my higher power. I turn this over. Um, mm -hmm. Or thank you for fixing this, you know, or yes. it's in perfect order. I don't see it yet. It looks crazy, but it's some bigger realm there's something good going on here. So everything's in perfect order. I'll say that to my, then my mind goes back here, right? Mm -hmm. Worry, 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 because it's my default setting. Right, and right. then I just notice it and bring it back to my positive thoughts and my loving thoughts. Mm -hmm. So it's, that's the um, puzzling or maybe confusing thing about um, overcoming worry and fear is that we want, we're worried about a situation, we want to fix it directly. And it's the opposite. We can't fix the situation just like relationships until we get a full sanity. We get ourselves sane, right. filled up with wisdom, um, connected to sources of wisdom that, uh, and good thoughts so that we can be calm, find our center of calm. Mm -hmm. And so the, the footwork that I do to fix a problem is to get my head screwed on straight by meditating, praying, golden key. I mean, there's 50 different techniques in there so that I can find a place of peace. And from that place will come the correct actions or words. And yes. many times it turns out I don't need to do or say anything. That is the guidance I get. But I can't fix a problem from a crazy mindset. Yeah, no, that's, it makes so much sense on so many levels, right? It's yeah. like, you get the, you know, anything created, created out of a place of fear does not bear fruit. And, and so often the lessons that I've learned in recovery, the solutions are 180 degrees away from my own thinking or my own impulse 
uh, responses to things. Like for instance, the whole, like, you know, before I entered the rooms, as we say, um, if I was angry at somebody that, you know, retaliation sounded like a good idea, but I, sh I show up to the rooms and they're like, no, no, uh, you pray for that person that they get everything that, you know, you wish you had. And it's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> that is the craziest thing I've ever heard. But I, I have done some crazy things in my time. So I was like, whatever, I'm going to try it. And it, it was, it addresses the whole measuring stick thing that we were talking about before it's you know and it's it, it redirects my thinking towards peace and it redirects my thinking towards what I do want and everything has a way of working out and uh, it's just yeah. amazing mm -hmm. I'm glad you're mentioning focusing on what we do want because um, I'm very interested in the law of attraction yes I'm obsessed and actually um, my first experience with it was I was so freaked out about my divorces and this was shortly after I got into recovery. I wrote a little affirmation. Thank you God for a happy and healthy relationship. And I put it in the bottom of my little makeup kit. And now like all these years later, I still have it in there. Dearly. But chapter four, I wrote uh, about choosing what you want for your future Yes. And using visioning, vision boards. I have pictures of the vision boards I use to write the book. Um, how, to, how to write an affirmation, how to hold it loosely enough so you're not saying, I want a red car tomorrow, you know, where God's right. or, or your higher power or higher wisdom can come in and, you know, uh, bring you something maybe even better. Yeah, this or something better. Yeah. We're going to have to have a whole nother conversation on laws of attraction. <laughs> I have so many questions for you. Um, I just uh, wanted to take, that was hugely helpful, by the way. Um, I just wanted to take a quick look at my notes because I was writing furiously as you were sharing things. You did mention a couple of other groups or spiritual practices. I think you and I had yep. discussed maybe Course of Miracles and, and right. did you, and did you have something else that you recommend? Well, you know, I was really leery of churchy kinds of <laughs> right. things. Religious, yeah. And uh, yeah, and so there is a, a church, a friend of mine calls not church because <laughs> she feels so comfortable there and it doesn't feel like the old image of church. Got and it. that's called, it's all over the world. It's called Unity Church. Unity, Unity Church. And okay. it's, it's not Unitarian, which is a whole different thing. That's a whole other thing. Also fine, yeah. But also Unity... Fine. Um, a lot of recovering people like it. A lot, like okay. the mini our minister in um, Naples is in a 12-step program awesome. know, in recovery, and he's a big, and they do like A Course in Miracles, and I do have a little blurb in there about A Course in Miracles. Love it. Um, but the best way to start, it's basically a, a teaching for how to choose, how to recognize that you're fearful and choose love and care instead and how to move away from being judging of others and towards seeing the goodness in others. And that's Unity um, Church that teaches well, that? Well, that's Course in Miracles. A Course in Miracles. But a yeah, lot of Unity yeah. churches are really into A Course in Miracles. Yeah. And the best book to um, get an introduction to that is by Marianne Williamson. Love it. came her. out a long time ago, and it's called A Return to Love. Mm -hmm. And it's so readable and so full of just truths that keep hitting you like you recognize they just feel true and if that book doesn't appeal then you know this may not be the spiritual path for you and there are plenty 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 of others so many uh, so, you know yeah. what's funny Gigi when I first got sober um I discovered Marianne Williamson and it was back in the days of cassette tapes Yes. And she would do lectures on the Course in Miracles based on different topics. It was like love and relationship, money. Um, the, well, those are two my two my two hot buttons. I don't even remember what the other ones were. <laughs> but I listened to those cassette tapes over and over and over because it was like every time I would hear it, I would sort of I would get it like on a new level. But as I was, I was like feeding my brain positive messages which edged out the negative the negative worry and thinking and exactly. uh and it brought me so much peace those mm -hmm. <laughs> those cassette dates yeah that's a, a really helpful suggestion for anyone who feels like it's just the committee in your head is so self-defeating 
So just wow. listen to positive podcasts and yeah. listen to open talks and listen, you know, just flood your brain with positive stuff. Mm -hmm. It works. It absolutely does. Oh my goodness. Well, listen, yeah. Gigi, I could talk to you forever. We might have to do another <laughs> round if you're up for it. Oh, I would but, love it. <laughs> okay. And I will, uh, so many resources you share just in this small amount of time. And I know, you know, that's the beautiful thing about a book is that mm -hmm. like you have 50 techniques yeah. in this book that can be referenced over and over again. Um, and I, I love that you have an audible book. I have like over a hundred titles on my phone. I love audiobooks. Oh, I'm so restless these days. <laughs> um, so much to do. We're tilling the fields of the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> one, of my, one of my buddies was a professor at, a, at an all boys school. And he said that one time, at Jim, if he's listening, Sorry. It was the funniest shit I ever heard in my life because um, he said it at a meeting full of drunks and drug addicts. But um, wow, such an amazing conversation. Thank you so much. I mean, oh, whew, I feel like I'm fun. levitating a little bit. But listen, I'll, so I'll leave links to all the resources that you mentioned okay. in the show notes. And I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for your time and your friendship. And I'm so excited to have you in my life as a personal friend. So thank, thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you so much for doing this with video because it, it's so much more personal and connecting feeling. Absolutely. I just love it, you know, so. <laughs> video anyway. will be on YouTube. <laughs> All right, my dear. Thank All you right. so much. Thanks really again, Judy. We'll talk it. soon. Thanks. All right. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye-bye.